On this episode of Postcards, something completely different. We've told the stories of other communities and histories many times over the years, but tonight we're going to turn the camera around and point it at us. This is the story of Pioneer, the first 50 years. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts, offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota. Explore hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for a great vacation or a place to hold an event. ExploreAlex.com. Tri-State Brain and Spine Institute. With locations in Alexandria, Edina, Crookston, and Maple Grove. Doctors dedicated to evaluating and treating all types of brain and spine problems, no matter how complex. It started 50 years ago. The story of small, rural communities working together for a common goal. The community of Appleton first received word of a possibility of a TV station in 1956. At that time, Appleton was a city of about 2,000 people, and the news must have been very exciting. Appleton was a thriving town, really. It had a penny store, and it had many hardware stores, and gas stations, and car lots and uh, grocery stores, and um, two or three restaurants. Marty McGowan, Jr. owned the Appleton Press here in town and was very active in all the civic affairs and was a, a state legislator. And while he was in St. Paul, or when he was down there, he found that the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, who would allow a television station to be located in Appleton or, or real close to Appleton. My dad came home and said that Eugene McCarthy called today and said there's money, federal money available for a station in Appleton if we want one. I said, well, what did you tell him? I said, where do I sign? Do we want one? Of course we do. <laughs> My dad spread the word around to the businessmen and they got the ball rolling to get some money raised and uh, everybody wanted the station. In order to get the station going, there were fundraising events, there were bake sales. You know, the different organizations in the city were all behind it. And so they supported the committee that was formed with the help of the state then. There was some state funding and we got it off the ground. Yeah, $22,000 was a lot of money in, uh, back in the late 50s. So yeah, it was a big job, but they got it done. Finally, in August of 1965, after more than five years of fundraising, they raised all of the needed funds. Much of the money came from grants, such as one from the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, one from the Hill Family Foundation, and there was help from KTCA, the station in the Twin Cities. In today's dollars, adjusted for inflation, the equivalent of about $130,000 was raised locally. One of the most important donations came in the form of land. In July 1963, a local family, the Leah family, 
donated eight acres southeast of Appleton, so there was a place to put the TV tower and transmitter. We went to our mom and dad, and they said, well, if it's, they, they had to have a high spot. And uh, mom and dad said, if that is a high spot, and it's, uh, it's agreed on, it's, it, we're donating it to you. They still needed a building to house the TV equipment. There happened to be a country school district nearby which had recently consolidated with Appleton. So there was now an empty school building available. The building was known as the Little Red Schoolhouse in a fairly good condition building. And they donated that to us and we moved it out there and that was called the Little Red Schoolhouse put back to use. The station first went on the air at 1.22 p.m. on February 7, 1966, as KWCM-TV. William Sandberg was the superintendent of schools here, and he also became the station's first general manager. In those days, it was all educational program, mostly used in school classrooms. The plan was that schools could pay the station at a rate of $1 per pupil. That first year, the courses included subjects like Spanish, German, French, science, math, and music. By 1969, 41 schools were using the programming and paying the membership fees. Unfortunately, there was really no way to enforce those fees on other schools who were using the programming but didn't want to pay. It was a time of uncertainty for the station. Then, in 1973, Sandberg took a job at a different school district and the station needed a new manager. They, we had the meeting and went around the room and, well, now what do we do? And I said, well, we can't let the station fail now. we got to do something. And I, I offered to take it over for a period of time until they found somebody. Well, I was manager for five years. And I had a full-time job with a bank, so you can imagine doing the station work why it was, uh, it, it was full-time. At the beginning, we, of course, weren't known as Pioneer Public Television. We were known as the West Central uh, Education Television Station. And at that time, we were selling strictly schools educational material. And my wife had a background in teaching, so she was hired and she called on all the schools in probably a, I don't know, 30 mile radius, 40 mile radius, selling educational material. In 1973, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting announced a new requirement for stations. The stations would have to produce local programming. This was a big challenge for KWCM. Ralph Schmidt reached out to the University of Minnesota Morris about 30 miles up the road. Uh, Ralph Schmidt, who was the acting general manager at the time, contacted me about doing a program. It was a program on the quality of the Minnesota River and it was produced in Madison, Minnesota, and that was in 1977, and Judge Miles Lord uh, moderated a panel discussion on, on the quality of the Minnesota River, and that was Pioneer Public's very first local production. Ralph Schmidt resigned in 1979. The station was left without a general manager, and the financial situation was grim. The educational television model was not bringing in much money, and they needed someone with new ideas. That's when Ansel Dahl came on as general manager. He was in town here and he was a, an accountant and uh, was very energetic and very, uh, what do I want to say, uh, active in the community and thought that he would just be a good man for it. So we approached him and sure enough he took the job and off to the races. He came over and I showed him the top file cabinet drawer was full of all the information he had to learn. He had not had anything to do with public television before that. So in order to get to learn to know PBS, and 
its purposes, he started reading and he read everything that was filed there. He was an idea man, completely an idea man. After he had read everything about public television, you know, he wanted more and more and more of it. And he wanted us to get a full day schedule of broadcast. He want, just wanted everything to grow quickly. He was just a tremendous uh, brainstormer. He knew the system. He worked well with the city folk here in uh, crafting grants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The word can't did not exist in his vocabulary. I think everybody here, everybody who's ever been here, may, may owe a, a great debt of gratitude to, to Ansel, because I think he saved the station through some very creative ways. Ansel believed that the station's costs should be supported locally. And this could be achieved only if the station served the local audience with local programming. KWCM broadcast its first live and local production in March of 1980. He needed to make money, and it's, that's when Roger Bauman comes involved. Roger at the University of Minnesota, Morse, he helped us do our first fundraiser. We did it from this building up in the Opera House. It was a great time. We had a lot of fun. We had a number of students involved from campus. Uh, it was really just uh, wing it type live production, but it was a great time. It was not heated. It had, uh, did not have central heat, and so they brought in some of these Nipco farm heaters. I think that run on kerosene. And so between pledge breaks, uh, when we were off the air, they would crank those things up, and of course that they were pretty pretty loud. Uh, but it did warm it up enough so we didn't freeze to death. And then during the pledge breaks, of course, we had to shut them down. And by the time we were through with the 15-minute pledge breaks, it was getting pretty cool again. In Ansel's first three years as general manager, membership numbers rose from 1,700 to 2,700 people. And the revenue also increased dramatically. The staff at KWCM was producing a lot of new local content, and the viewers loved it. Soon, the station was growing fast, and it needed more space. Soon, we discovered there was just not room back in that office for what we had to go on. We liked, you know, Ansel, I know Ansel had all kinds of ideas in his mind. And one day, I came to work one morning to that office, and it was empty, absolutely empty. And so I thought, he's been talking about moving into that old fire hall, the old uh, city hall. I bet he did it, and sure enough, he had done it over the weekend with his, he had his sons help him, and he'd moved everything into the city hall. People wanted us to succeed. We had the backing of the whole town. That pigeon deal, we had, I don't know how many pigeons. I, I sold them for a dollar a piece. Guys came and got them and uh, took them out here to this hunting cap and then used them for trap shooting. Well, the pigeons had all ended. Them guys couldn't shoot. <laughs> the pigeons all ended up back in the bell tower. So then the guy came and wanted his pigeons back, and I said, well, a buck and a quarter, you can have it. <laughs> yeah, he got me, but he paid me. As the station grew, the idea of rebranding came up. People from all over the area submitted name ideas and they settled on Pioneer Public TV. It was not a team of experienced TV producers working at Pioneer then. It was a group of local people, without much experience, who were just passionate about the work. Good morning. I'm Don Eggert on behalf of Pioneer Public Television. You may wonder why I'm coming on television wearing a pair of sunglasses. 
Well, we're going to watch a program called AM Weather in just a couple of moments. And whether we wear our sunglasses or whether we wear our regular glasses, that depends a lot on the weather. You know, had he hired professional people? I mean, he was, Ansel was lucky in the fact that he hired ignorant farm boys like ourselves, like Dale Lean, Scott Moen, and I, because we didn't know any better. And, and it's your, it's your if, if a job's got to get done, you figure out how to do it. Nobody, none of us went to school and said, okay, to do a TV production, you need a director, a cameraman, a floor director, an audio man, and a graphics man. We didn't know that. So we didn't know any better, so we figured out how to do it. I mean, we did that with a lot of things. You know, we just, there was nothing, there was nowhere to go but up. But well, Jonathan, I think, was probably one of the first, or maybe been the first employee. And I remember the first day he was here, he asked me, you know, what he was supposed to do. I said, I don't know what the hell he's supposed to do. <laughs> you figure it out. So he did. He did a good job. He started our production operation. You know, we just learned. We watch other TV stations. How do they do it? Oh, oh okay. They, they don't zoom out at the end. Okay, let's try that, you know. And so it was just experimentation constantly. And I still have that attitude, sir. It's just a TV station. Have fun. A number of important local programs premiered during this time. Shows like On Call for Health, which was a live call-in show hosted by two doctors. Another show was Legal Lines, also a call-in show, this one hosted by lawyers. And of course, Your Legislators, a discussion of hot-button political topics. And there was also Prairie Yard and Garden and The Great TV Auction. The first TV auction, my God, it was just a total unorganized, chaotic mess with big boards on the wall. I, I would challenge any commercial station to pull it off with the people, as few people as we had, but everybody was good. Tim, John, Arlen, everybody was so good, that baby, and not only was it great fun doing it, it was great public relations. I mean, people loved that auction. Throughout the 1980s, the station's financial circumstances had never been ideal. But in the 1990s, the situation became bleak. Federal and state funding were decreasing. And in 1991, Governor Arne Carlson recommended the elimination of all state funds for public television. General Manager Ansel Dahl met with the board and actually told them that if they couldn't come up with a new source of funding, the station would have to close. Because of recent state budget cuts, Pioneer Public TV will lose $145,000 this year. In 1981, we faced a much larger budget cut, and viewers like you pulled together and carried us through. Support the programs you enjoy. Become a new member. Renew your current membership or send an additional gift contribution to Pioneer Public TV, Appleton, Minnesota, 56208. The expansion of Pioneer did happen pretty relatively quickly. And, you know, it, it always takes the revenue and the income to supplement that growth. And that just wasn't happening as quickly as it could have. And so there were some financial struggles, and, and I know there was a time when everybody was wondering if they would have a job. Happily for Pioneer, the state legislature did not follow Governor Carlson's recommendations, but the experience alerted the Pioneer management of the need for a more stable revenue stream. They ultimately decided to expand the broadcast signal in order to grow the membership base. 
in December 1996, with the help of a grant from the state of Minnesota, a new Pioneer Tower and Transmitter Building were installed in Murray County. It was called KSMN. Another signal, K49FA, began broadcasting from Fergus Falls in 1999. Pioneer's broadcast signal was now available to more than 750,000 viewers. It was about 1996, in fact it was 1996, when uh, Ansel Dahl had the idea of going on location uh, in Gibbon, Minnesota to do fun time polka. And uh, it is still one of our most popular programs today and it's, it's just very well received. <laughs> In the 90s, we were doing um, all several local shows, Legal Lines, On Call for Help, Your Legislators, Prairie Yard and Garden, um, and a lot of, lot of one-offs as we call them, but extremely busy uh, from a production standpoint. Prairie Sportsman, honestly, is the only program I've ever been the, the producer of. And it too was a live program, and, and we actually reached out a lot to the Department of Natural Resources, the DNR, uh, which helped us a lot, almost on every program. And I think it was beneficial to both the viewer and the DNR, uh, and the station, for that matter. Uh, I heard stories of, of up in Alexandria, the sportsmen would flock to this, this one bar just to watch Prairie Sportsmen on Sunday night. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Hi folks, Rich Massey for Prairie Sportsman, asking you to join us again next week, February 12th, for an episode we call The Deer Hunters. Join us for a family deer hunt. You'll see mom, dad, and all the kids participating in a fun fall festival. February 12th, The Deer Hunters, Prairie Sportsman, be there. In the year 2000, Pioneer produced the popular three-part Country Spires series about the importance and beauty of rural churches. Narrated by poet Bill Holm, this critically acclaimed program was broadcast by PBS stations throughout the nation. But the little church's stained glass eyes, rimmed with arched brows, have hardly dimmed, allowing only light from the secular world to peer into the sacred sanctuary. After more than 20 years as general manager at Pioneer, Ansel Dahl retired in 2000. Glenn Cerny was hired as his successor. I'm trying to remember the first time I met Glenn Cerny, but I liked him right away because he was a Green Bay Packer fan. And so we got along really, really well. He was very easygoing, had a kind of a dry sense of humor, but I, I liked working with him. And um, he sort of was a hands-off type person. So in other words, the, the production side, he would sort of turn it over to the production people um, and trusted people to do jobs well, and they did. Cerny came on board at a pivotal moment in the station's history. Some of his big challenges were navigating the congressionally mandated conversion to digital television. He also had to tackle an alarming pile of debt that had accumulated during the 1990s. In the years that followed, Station manager John Panzer played a key role in guiding the station successfully through the digital conversion process. Glenn Cerny's mission to tackle the debt was successful. From 2001 to 2006, Pioneer's long-term debt was reduced by more than $900,000. In 2007, Les Heen became the general manager and uh, this is the first time, that I know of anyway, where we had a, a gentleman who was a farm boy, but he also had television experience, which is certainly something Ansel Dahl and the rest of the renegades back then did not have. He has tons of connections with his former jobs that he's had, and he's been really good for the station in that way. Um, I, I will call him about certain issues, and he can, he can steer me in the direction of who I should be talking to. He's just a wealth of information. Um, again, I think he, it, he lets the professionals do what they do best and uh, he manages the station very well and I think he's very forward-looking when it comes to the, to the future of Pioneer Public Television. In 2008, Minnesota voters passed what was known as the Clean Water, Land and Legacy Amendment to the Minnesota Constitution. 
This created a funding stream that allowed Pioneer to hire local producers and videographers to create local programs about the art, culture, and history of the region. New programs that have premiered since then include Postcards, Great Minnesota Parks, and On Stage, to name a few. In 2013, Pioneer's first Upper Midwest Regional Emmy was awarded to Caroline Smith, My Way Back Home, produced by Dana Johnson. In all the years that I've been here, I have never seen more talent than we have right now, ever. The Pioneer has come a long way from its beginnings in the Little Red Schoolhouse. Today, Pioneer reaches approximately 2.5 million viewers through combined broadcast, cable, and satellite services. As we continue to grow, we remain committed to serving rural communities and upholding rural values in an otherwise urban-focused media environment. I think as we get more and more diverse in our sources of information and news, I think it's really important that we have a strong emphasis on the local because you're not going to get it anywhere else. And so I think it's very important. Culturally, historically, uh, artistically, it's really important to have Pioneer Public Television here. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts, offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota. Explore hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for a great vacation or a place to hold an event. ExploreAlex.com. Tri-State Brain and Spine Institute. With locations in Alexandria, Edina, Crookston, and Maple Grove. Doctors dedicated to evaluating and treating all types of brain and spine problems, no matter how complex.